we had looked at the history of France from 1789 to 1848 earlier in fair degree of details. We had also looked at the 1848 revolution in France. Today, we look at the history of the Second Republic, which was short-lived, and the Second Empire. In other words, we look at the history of France from 1848 to 1871. By February 1848, the July regime of Louis Philippe was virtually a spent force. It was reeling under a socio-economic crisis which was compounded by corruption in public life and political ineptitude. The crisis was compounded also by a crisis of confidence and therefore the February Revolution of 1848 probably did not come as a total surprise, particularly in view of the fairly rapid advance of republican ideas and to some extent socialist ideas during the July monarchy. The regime had virtually lost its legitimacy and even its supporters were losing faith in the July monarchy of Louis Philippe. The revolution was brought about by a coalition of forces and once the revolution was made, it was seen that there was a cliff hedge uh, among these forces. There were conservatives on the one, one hand, moderate republicans, more radical republicans and the socialists on the other. A small but determined group was trying to take advantage of the revolution to consolidate the republic and to initiate uh, at least a, a program of reform and a possible radical uh, reform. The provisional government was headed by Lamartine, the aristocrat, poet and historian and it had both moderate and, and radical elements. Even the moderates under the pressure of expectation by the people of Paris who had joined in with a visible enthusiasm in the revolution was obliged to accept some of the radical reforms like the introduction of adult uh, manhood uh, suffrage etc. The freedom of the press was declared, there was less control over the publications now, the liberty to form associations had been granted, the National Guard was uh, democratized etc. There were also people like Le Drou Roland, Louis Blanc the socialist and uh, the working class member of the provisional government Albert who advocated a more radical program for the new government. The situation was summed up by Alexis de Tocqueville in these words. He described Paris of the time to be, quote, solely in the hands of those who owned nothing, unquote. Now, in this kind of circumstances, what the Republic would ultimately represent was not very clear at the beginning. What recalled uh, 1789 in a way was the association of the people with many new associations and political clubs. There was, for example, Blocky's Central Republican Society or Barbessas Club. They had a fairly radical program and indeed the manifesto of Barbessas Club said that political reform is an instrument of social reform. In other words, there had been an expectation of radical reform and of a change in the uh, social composition uh, and, and there was an expectation that 
the changes which had occurred in the society over the last half century or so would be reflected in the political structure that would be created. But the people in general were determined to see that the revolution was not hijacked by scheming politicians like it had been in 1830. The provisional government started by providing for national workshops or earthly and nationaux where those who did not have any work would be provided work on a daily basis. There was the Luxembourg Commission which comprised representatives of the government, of the employers and the workers to look into the situation, investigate the conditions of the working class, suggest suitable measures that would ameliorate their conditions. The government, however, was more keen to preserve order to, to begin with and to restore the confidence of the business classes as well. In the meantime, arrangements were to be made for the elections. The introduction of the universal adult male suffrage had suddenly enfranchised the common people of France. The pay legal or the electorate had increased from 250,000 to about 10 million. But unfortunately, the radicals, because of their lack of organization, were not able to seize this opportunity and have a larger number of the deputies elected in the new legislative assembly. On the other hand, the conservatives and the moderates, because of their superior organization, were able to have a larger number of their members returned to the election. The election results disappointed the radicals as their lack of organization and experience had made likely. On 15th May, there was a major demonstration organized in Paris leading to the invasion of the assembly's meeting place. They demanded, among other things, the setting up of a committee of public safety and the imposition of wealth tax on the rich. The conservatives, on the other hand, viewed this with not inconsiderable alarm. They felt that once again, the rabble of Paris is rising and they are out to destroy order once more. As one of the newspapers said that the national workshop meant that 80,000 people were paid to learn about revolt. And therefore, this government now decided to close the national workshops. Well, this is where the poor, workless people would go to find some relief. And this created a reaction against the government of the Second Republic. On 23rd June, barricades went up in the poorer districts of Paris and the government on its part decided to tackle this with force. And as a result, there was a bloodbath in the days of June. Over three days, there had been a ruthless repression of uh, the insurgents who numbered between 20 and 30,000 people. These people now felt desperate because they felt that the conservative attitude of the government would mean that the revolution had to be started afresh. Their new slogan was liberty and death. But when they took to the streets, the government responded by brutal uh, suppression. General Kavanagh, who was the defense minister, was virtually made in charge of the government and there was no hesitation on his part in tackling this situation with force and force alone. As one artist had described the contemporary situation, I'm quoting him again. He saw defenders, quote, 
shot down, hurled out of windows, the ground strewn with corpses, the earth red with blood." Unquote. It was in a way a class struggle between the bourgeoisie who wanted to preserve order and the common poorer working people who wanted a radicalization of the political structure. As Tocqueville put it, I am quoting him again, quote, the insurrection was a brutal, blind but powerful attempt by the workers to escape from the necessities of their condition. These poor people had been assured that the well-being of the rich was in some way based upon theft from themselves." Unquote. The new constitution was ultimately promulgated in 1848, in November 1848. It provided for election of a president with a strong executive authority. The elections were held in December and the results had been overwhelming victory for Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, better known as Louis Napoleon, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. He had 74% of the votes as against General Kavanagh, the conservative, even reactionary hero of the June days of 1848, received only 19% of the votes. Louis Napoleon obviously exploited the Bonapartist myth as it had developed over the last few decades. Indeed, he contributed to this earlier by a pamphlet entitled Des Idées Napoleoniennes. He also put forward extremely vague socialist ideas in another tract called L'Extinction du Pauperism or the Extinction of Poverty. The new president chose to continue with the personnel of the July regime by and large. He allied himself with the so-called party of order that wanted to preserve large doses of continuity with the earlier regime. Obviously, the people were not uh, content or happy with this. The elections of May 1848 revealed a sharper cleavage between the conservatives and the more radical Republicans. In May, when the elections actually held, the radicals, however, succeeded in having around 200 elected to the chamber as opposed to 500 that the moderates and conservatives had managed. The democrat socialist combination had support not just in Paris or Lyon, but also in the countryside. Opposition was particularly strong in the communes, the small towns, and even in some parts of the countryside, particularly in the southeast regions of France. Newspapers, pamphlets, songs, these were the various media which the more radicals used in order to articulate their demands and their grievances. They denounced excessive taxation, exploitation by the rich and what they called the tyranny of capitalism. The history of the short-lived republic, second republic therefore, was a history of struggle between two sets of political ideas and social forces. The expectation of the people propelled as they were by radical propaganda, were increasingly frustrated as the conservative temperament of the government, particularly of the personnel who ran the government, including the president, became clear as they were hell-bent on preserving order and in excluding any radicalism. They even effected a change in the electoral law, which imposed stricter residential qualifications and it meant that about one-third of the poorer voters were disenfranchised. 
The left-wing newspapers and organizations were constantly under surveillance and check. A new law on primary education had encouraged religious instruction and uh, clergy was given greater control over education once more. As the legislative and presidential elections of 1852 became imminent, there had been rumors of a red insurgence of a growth of radicalism and Louis Napoleon was in no mood to give up. There was no provision in the constitution for the president to be re-elected but Napoleon decided to remain in power by emulating his illustrious uncle. He first effected a coup of sorts in December 1851 when he extended the authority of the president. The method that he followed was also the same that his uncle had followed. He put it to a plebiscite. He put it out as a choice between civiliz civilization and barbarism, between order and chaos. He asked the people to endorse or reject the extension of presidential authority. The result of the vote had been overwhelming victory again for Louis Napoleon. 7.5 million eyes with only 640,000 nays. What is however significant is that there were 1.5 million people who abstained. This plebiscite and this coup d'etat had not been the end. One year later in 1852 there was another coup of sorts and another plebiscite which endorsed this coup. The Second Republic was transformed like the First Republic had been to a hereditary empire and Louis Napoleon, the President of France, Republican France, now became Emperor as Napoleon III. Thus the French crisis of mid-19th century produced a revolution which was hijacked by yet another Napoleon. Karl Marx in his 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon considered this to be a repetition of history. To him, the first time it was a stark tragedy, the second time around it was a broad farce. More recent historians like Jean Toulard we had seen earlier considered Napoleon Bonaparte to be a savior invented by the bourgeoisie. He was also the first in a long line of succession of such saviors. Napoleon III was also one of them. People with property were keen to protect their property and the radicalism of the radical republicans and the socialists where was to them a threat to the very principle of property and what they possessed. Therefore, they were willing to make yet another compromise with Napoleon. Even the petty bourgeoisie, the lower middle class, who as Engels had put it, oscillated between the hope of climbing up the social order and the fear of climbing down it all too soon, decided to throw in their lot with Napoleon the third. Louis Napoleon as a president had ruled for four years and he was to rule as the emperor for another 18 years. And when his regime came to an end, it was a military disaster that would explain the debacle. Napoleon III self-professedly followed the model of his more illustrious uncle, Napoleon Bonaparte. His rule, there is no doubt, was a usurpation of power. He destroyed the republican constitution he swore to preserve. However, he sought to mask this usurpation by providing some kind of legitimacy to his 
to his office by preserving the form of parliamentary government and by adopting what he believed was a popular policy. In many ways, his rule represents a paradox. There was authoritarianism on the one hand, there was also a gradual advance of parliamentarism in course of his reign, particularly in the 1860s. He had some good qualities, even talent, but plainly lacked the charisma of his great uncle whom he sought to emulate. It is not for nothing that Victor Hugo called him the Petit Napoleon or the Little Napoleon. The new constitution that he introduced gave all power to the president. The president was to make all nominations, all appointments, and the ministers were to be responsible to him. The lower house would be known as the legislative body. It would be elected on the basis of universal franchise, male franchise, and there would be a senate of life members who would be largely nominated by the members. The senate was to examine the legislation to ensure that there was no conflict with the constitution. He was a firm believer in the institutions of the consulate and the empire during Napoleon's time and revived the Council of State. The Council of State was a core of Napoleonic authoritarianism. Thus the parliamentary system was to begin with a mockery and France was ruled by a centralized despotism. A primary weakness of the regime was that of any personal regime. Its longevity depended on that of the emperor. Further, there was nothing called a Bonapartist team. The Bonapartists did not represent a coherent group of men with uniform ideas, with shared agenda. Napoleon, however, demonstrated over a period of time a remarkable capacity to adapt to circumstances. And he had undoubted skill at maneuvering. Another explanation that would go in favor of the regime was the vitality of the economy that was apparent in the 1860s. A series of reverses in foreign policy obliged him to seek support from a genuine parliamentary system increasingly in the 1860s. The legislative body was allowed to discuss the speech from the throne. The press control was relaxed. The newspapers were allowed to uh, publish the debates in the uh, legislative body. Despite of continuing censorship and control, the press did acquire some freedom. Restrictions on public meetings had also been uh, relaxed to a great extent. Ultimately, uh, even the Republican opposition grew and very significant parliamentary leaders like Thiers, Gambetta or Jules Ferry emerged in the process. Well, the elections of this, this gradual relaxing and you know, introduction of parliamentary freedom was seen in the election results. In 1857, only seven opposition members were elected. In 1863, the number increased to 35 and it rose to 93 in 1869. Opposition politicians came mainly from the urban areas, the large cities like Paris, Lyon, Marseille and Bordeaux. In 1852, the press was virtually stifled, but the growth of literacy and education increasingly created a reading public. This brought about a re revival of Republican activity, particularly the world of journalism. Le Siecle, very important newspaper, had a circulation of 44,000 in 1866. In 1868, when the controls were further relaxed, no fewer than 140 new journals began to be published in course of only one year. Le Rappel published very critical comments of the government and Victor Hugo 
who was a legend by then, was a regular contributor. Another newspaper, La, Lan La Lantern, the Lantern, acquired a circulation ultimately of 120,000. And it wrote, quote, the empire has 36 million subjects, not counting the subjects of discontent, unquote. This was an eloquent comment on what the newspapers could and did do. There were also royalists and other uh, more radical groups like the revolutionary socialists. The International Working Men's Association or the First International which was set up in the late 1860s had a fair following in, in France. There were many who were associated with this First International. There were also the Blanquists and they would all be very active when the regime came to an end in the rising of the Paris Commune. But the strongest groups were led by men like Thiers, who led the moderates, or Gambetta, who led the Republicans. In the 1850s, the opposition defended basic freedom and they defended journalists against persecution. So Victor Hugo wrote a famous piece called The Punishment, mounting a scathing criticism on the Second Empire. But in 1864, Thiers demanded five fundamental freedoms. These included security of citizens against personal violence and arbitrary power, liberty of the press, freedom of public opinion. In contrast, the radicals by 1868 were seeking the extension of universal suffrage to even the municipal elections. They wanted separation of the church and the state compulsory and secular primary education for all and election of all parliamentary functionaries. In this way, paradoxically, the empire provided sufficient ground for political training.